Because imagine if it was specific you know, rules that you can only go in this way, you can only go in that way, whatever. For example, it has to be the man that has to approach. You know these kind of classic things that, that women uh, you know, in our societies spend day and night talking about, I can't go and propose to him, it's always going to be the man who's going to come and propose, and all this kind of rubbish, right? Yeah. Well, actually it's not rubbish, I suppose, because we can relate to it, can't we, right? And we talk about the non-Muslims here, not the, the Muslims. In Islam, there's, there's guidelines, right? It doesn't have to be man has to propose to woman, woman has to propose to man, it's, it's, you know, it's open. The reality of it is that uh, uh, it, this, the guidelines are understood easier by understanding what you can't do, if that makes sense. Okay? So if you know what you can't do, then you know that everything else is okay. So what can't you do? You cannot be alone with a member of the opposite sex. Okay? And being alone, right, is, uh, has, has almost two dimensions. Okay, so two dimensions, for example, would be spending uh, some significant, significant period of time conversing in an intimate fashion with one other person, even if you're in a, like a, uh, a public area. So just imagine a park where there's people playing over there, people playing over there, and then you guys are in the middle, right? Now, technically speaking, this is not isolation, right? okay? Because other people can see and people can approach you at any time, and so on, and so on. And you can run any time, do something any time. So isolation. It's not, you know, technically this is not isolation, right? So here, but this is not something which is, which is correct because you're, you're making yourself a pseudo-isolated uh, kind of state, right? And that kind of interaction in that situation shouldn't occur. And the classic thing which is of course impermissible is for you to be isolated in a room or in an area which does not have access to the outside with a member of the opposite sex. This is haram. Okay? Likewise, to be continuing discussions via other means with a person that you're not married to, where the discussion goes out of the, bound, out of the, the limits of what is necessary, that is also something which is impermissible. So for example, if you send an email to a sister to say that, yes, I will do this work that you, you know, said to me, that's fine, all right? Or, yes, I'd like to order so-and-so, and thank you, and there's your whatever, that's fine. But when you start saying, right, yeah, I'd like to order this and that, and hey, that's nice, uh, thank you, wear it there. 
<laughs> and uh, you know, and uh, you know, uh, yeah, I'll get that project done. And you know, can we be up uh, at town and so on and so on? You know, it's kind of whatever. And you know, you know, I mean, you don't let me explain this to you. You, you. Everyone knows what, what you know. You get that feeling, right? Everyone gets that feeling when you're going past what they should be got. Everyone recognizes that. And the reason your ears are going red, right, is because they are meant to go red at that stage. Hunger lies our body's natural reaction. When you're going out from where you should be to where you shouldn't be, then you know the heart beats are increasing, and you all get better, right? And you hear something go whatever. <laughs> you shouldn't be there. And the reason you're there and that's happening is because you've gone woo, too far. So general, that's that's the general guidelines, really. That's it. And other than that, you're okay. So you see Yanni this man, and you see the sister, and he says, "MashaAllah, that is the girl that I want." That is the girl that I want. So, what does he do? Then he should either tell another person, for example, his friend whose sister knows her or whatever, or tells his sister himself to go and whatever, or tells uh, another person who's able to convey the message that so-and-so brother is interested in marriage and can he meet and discuss and see what's happening. And then that will then be arranged through the relevant parties, should be with the permission of parents, especially in the case of a girl. And the best way, of course, and the most noble way, and what was classically the, 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 you know, the understood way, is that the man approaches the parents. And because sometimes that's unrealistic, because it's sometimes unrealistic because he doesn't know the parents at all, and it's going to be an immediate kind of, you know, oh, kind of thing from the parents. So he goes to a, a, an intermediary. So he go to maybe uh, an elder in the masjid, or an uncle that knows someone that knows someone, blah, 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 who then knows the father and then speaks to them. So that, that initial contact comes from someone that the father respects, okay? And that's very, very important. Respect is very, very important. So when a young whippersnapper upstart comes and says, you know, what's happening, you know, <laughs> then, you know, he kind of looks at him and thinks, you know, what? Yeah, and, and that's just not going to work. But that's the classical way. That's of course in our society. I mean, you know, as a father, whatever, if I saw someone, you know, I had a daughter that went to get married, and some guy came to my door from our times, I'd, I'd laugh, really. But I mean, back in the day, of course, it was different, right? When men were men, as they used to say, right? So when man comes to, 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 to the door, it's not just some, you know, some bloke that's from, from, you know, from whatever university, but this is a man who has uh, been in the company of the Prophet وسلم, who is a person who spends his nights and he praying, who spends his days fasting, who has gone and fought jihad and sacrificed his time and his wealth and his money and that was the community. So when man comes to the door, then you open the door and say, come in my friend. You understand? So that's, that's something which of course is not the case today. So we have to use our own initiative, right? But the last thing that you want to do is to try and contact this girl directly because that only leads to further problems. Yeah, I need that kind of slippery soap kind of problems that at the beginning doesn't seem like anything. A little a few words, a bit of chit chat, a little quick kind of catch a quick conversation, and then that down you go. And that's the problem. And in the meantime, of course, if you're, uh, 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 because the, the, the question also mentions how do you actually get started? What if you don't even have a particular sister that, you're, you know, that you've seen? Then you are allowed to look at another woman for the sake of marriage. And likewise, of course, the opposite. So if you're looking to get married, you are allowed to look at women and say, right, you know, I heard this on social or whatever, and I want to find a person who's uh, religious, or I want to find a person who's active, or I want to find a person who's this, or whatever, and you put the word out, and you're looking around, and you find it, and you find the person that you're looking for. Even, you know, the companions, you know, the companions of Ramsar, I said that, in many authentic narrations, you see them spy on certain women. So just watch out behind the phone, girls, because, you know, there's going to be someone looking. Yeah. But like I said, it's not, a, not, 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 not something which is haram because the intention is solely and yeah, only for the case that yes, this girl is potentially someone I want to marry. And it has to be someone who's been specified, not just you know, spying everyone. Right? <laughs> we're, talking about, we're talking about, you know, this is the sister I'm interested in. I just want to just get you know, a clear idea of what's going on. So you might have one or two extra different looks to make sure that everything's okay and so on. Are married couples allowed to uh, bath and shower together? Yes, they are, absolutely. Should I answer that? 
Yeah. Are married couples allowed to have relationships? No, 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 they're not allowed. They, they, they are. I mean, is there a problem with that? No? That's a question itself. Is there anything? Can you explain why? Can you explain, oh, explain why? Okay, good. Uh, the, the explanation why. Why? Because the, the, you know the hijab, all right? The hijab is the protection of, the, of what's called the aura. The aura, okay? Um, one's aura is that part of the body which can never be seen by another person. Okay? Now, aura is divided into two, like soft and hard aura, you can almost call it, right? Yeah, and there's certain things that, you know, you have the concept of mahram and non mahram, right? Mahram is that person that you cannot get married to due to yeah, either uh, the family link, right? Because he's your father, right? Or because he's your brother, or because he's your son or because he's your uncle, or whatever, right? So that person is mahram. You are not allowed to get married to that person, okay? And likewise, if you've been breastfed by someone, uh, and then her husband, and so on. So uh, the, 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 the one becomes mahram either by lineage, or by uh, marriage, which is you know, a detailed thing, we don't want to get into that now, or by breastfeeding, again, detailed, don't want to get into it now. These are the people who you can't get married to. If you can't get married to a person, then it means that you don't have to cover as much of your aura in front of them. So for example, classically, you don't need to cover your hair, you don't need to cover your feet, you don't need to cover your, your arms or something like that. You can walk around you know, pretty much relaxed in the house, okay? But then for the woman, then you have the hard area okay, of aura, which is not seen by anyone, okay? Neither other women or neither <coughs> other uh, uh, mahrams or anything. And that's just the private parts and so on, okay? And likewise for the male. Right, the male has a, a hard order between his his uh, uh, belly button, effectively, and his knee or the top of the knee or even the half of the thigh, according to different opinion. Most of the the this this part of aura cannot be seen by any other person. Okay, right, and the exception is for the partner, for the one who is married, because there is no aura between the wife and the husband. There is no aura. That's the, that's the, that's the reason. Okay. There's no aura, there's nothing hidden between the, 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 the wife and the And if there was, that'd be pretty useless, isn't it? Pretty pointless, you know what I'm saying? Like, what kind of, what kind of marriage is that? <laughs> no. So, if you wish to get to know someone before marriage, how should you go about it? Acting in accordance with Sharia law. I think that's covered, yeah? I think that's, that's kind of, you know, dealt with. Question. I've been led to believe that you are allowed to interact with the female when absolutely necessary. At university, you cannot last the course without seeking help from females at some stage. But if you don't make friendship, how is this possible? Someone who we regularly meet at uni, for example, and always greet, can be considered a friend. Is this not allowed? You know, uh, um, I might have just said that the wrong way around. Anyway, the, um, <coughs> the point here, again, it's going back to the, 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 the principles in the, the main talk and what I just said now, that for a need, so for example, yeah, the uh, women who are studying, okay, you have to look at the lecturer, you have to take notes down. Women who are buying something from a man, have to look at the person and deal with it, and likewise the other way around. And so, there's a many exempt categories, okay, from the normal laws of interaction. So normally there wouldn't be this discussion that goes on between people, but when there is a need, then that happens. And so for example, if you're in a situation, and it's not good by the way, it's not good. If you can avoid interacting with a woman yani, in your course, and you can generally, except in, in a few circumstances where you're forced by random whatever to, 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 you know, to, 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 to sit with uh, women and so on and so on. I can tell you, I can tell you, I went to I went university. I went to the best university, Manchester, Manchester, okay? <laughs> <laughs> I went to, 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 to Manchester University four years, and I can tell you that I, I don't think that I was forced to, to maybe, maybe I can, in the four, four, three years or whatever, maybe five times, I think that I was forced to interact with a woman in terms of group work or anything like that, because pretty much we were given free reign. I don't know, I don't think things have changed that much. So I think that if you really want to control yourself, whatever, and avoid it, and it should be avoided. It should be avoided, there's no doubt about that. But if you need to work together for some kind of reason, then that is permissible. That is permissible for a legal reason you can work together. But I advise you, I only advise you this because I know that it's good for you. I know that it's good for you because it's what the Prophet said has good, is good for you. And I've seen it myself, and people have seen it themselves, and you know people, and you know friends, and whatever. Increase the interaction, increase the time. It's an exponential relationship of time together 
and desirability. You make the graph, it's there. Yani, extra minutes, do it uh, across my minutes. One minute, two minutes, three minutes, just enough few words, whatever. It's like magic, subhanAllah. Love, Aki, you know love. They spend, yani, the Arabs, right, the Muslims, we're the masters, of the, we're the love doctors, by the way. <laughs> right? If you want to hear about love and the beauty of love and romance and, and, and describing women and describing beauty, then come and look at our books. Come and look at the books of poetry and the books of, of Jannah and the books of yani, uh, describing the world and so on. So. Yani, the, the ulama of Islam used to write reams upon poetry about beauty and women and so on and so on. So yani, we recognize more than anyone else the, the power and the, the addictive nature of love. The addictive nature of the relationship between men and women. Which is why we, as much as humanly possible, decrease the, con the, the contact in between. Because the Islamic system is not like the, the, the Western or the, the secular system. We don't try and solve a problem after it's occurred. Islamic system always deals with the problem before it occurs. All right? We absolutely cut off all the possible avenues. So kissing, for example, the reason there's no hadith that says don't kiss, there's no hadith. But it's zina because it is a path to zina. So it's haram. And therefore, you know, the looking, and therefore that becomes haram. And therefore, that which causes you to look more, that becomes haram. And then that which causes you to look even more, the cause of that, i.e. increased contact, that becomes haram. That's how the Sharia operates. It looks at a final goal, and it recognizes, right, that's a problem. Is it real? Yes. How are we going to deal with it? Right, we're going to cut off all of the roots and all of the possible paths to that problem. That is how Sharia deals with it. So therefore, and only you as an individual will be able to know what you're doing is dodgy, what you're doing is too far, what you're doing is going beyond the limits. That's why the Prophet said in a hadith that take fatwa, take fatwa from your heart. You're in a situation, ask your heart, because you know, and I know you know, because I know, everyone knows, it's human nature, when you are getting into somewhere where you shouldn't be going. Now, um, how would you advise young people to go about finding spouses? Especially if parents expect you or don't mind you finding your own partner and keeping it halal, of course. You know, uh, um, I think that, that you know, once you understand what the priorities are in finding your partner, so if you're a female, then you should be looking for a husband yani, who is a person of religion, okay? And a person of religion, likewise, of course, for the man, the, the man looking for the woman, right? You should be looking for yani, a person of deen. And I tell you why. I tell you why. Because a person can be beautiful, and a person can be rich, and a person can be from a very noble family. But if the deen is not good, then the relationship is going to be on rocky grounds. Why? Because you want to progress, don't you? That's the whole aim in life, that you want to progress in your religion. Because when you get married, I can tell you this, I can tell you this, that Islamic work, right, or my, effect, or my effectiveness in Islamic work and anything that I've been able to study and do, although from one point of view, it became difficult when I, get, when I got married, in terms of seeking knowledge, because that you need to really do very quickly and put a lot of hours in and, you know, spend a lot of time to, you know, by yourself and so on. That other things from my Islamic obligations and Islamic work, <clears throat> became so incredibly easier when I got married. Okay, so incredibly easy to know that I had a system, that I had a, that I had the security of being able to come home and making sure that things were okay and that things were solid for me to be able to refer back in the day and, and yet all of the classic benefits that one person takes from stability. A marriage is stability. A marriage is an opportunity for you to do what is most beneficial for you. So therefore. Yani, if you don't have that respect between the two people, and that respect between the two people is not going to come because you're good looking, or because you're wealthy, or because you're whatever, but it's because the woman recognizes that the Prophet ﷺ has commanded her to obey her husband. And the, like by the other, the other way around, the Prophet ﷺ has commanded, the Prophet, the, the Prophet ﷺ said, خير كم, خير The best of you are those who are best to their families. So the Prophet ﷺ made it very, very clear. The best of you are those who are blessed from another reward, another narration. The, 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 the best of you are khairul al-nisa'ikum. The best of you are those who are best to your, to your women. So the Prophet has made it very, very clear how the man should treat and act with the woman. 
And so when one knows this from the deen and respects the deen, then they're going to make everything so easy for you. They're going to give you what you wish, what you want, and you're making you happy all the time. It's going to become an act of religious worship for that person. So if you get married to a person who's fantastically good looking and rich or whatever, but has no respect for the religion, and respect for the religion, I mean, you know, just because he prays or something, you know, just like that, whatever, is not respect for the religion per se. Respect for the religion means that when the statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes, or when the Prophet name is mentioned, and the person's like, whoa, that's the Prophet and that's the statement of Allah azza wa jal. And yani, his demeanor changes, and his priorities change, and yani, that's what's got to be done. That's what's obligatory upon me. That's what I need to do now. A person, that you get married to a person like that, then you can guarantee your future. You can guarantee your happiness. Because that person is now under the law of Allah and the law of Islam and it's impermissible for him to mistreat you, to make you unhappy, to oppress you, and so on and so on. You are protected by Islam. So if you get married to a person who does not respect Islamic uh, 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 law and have an Islamic uh, character, then what do you think you'll get? And likewise for the men. And even more so for the men. Because the men, their greatest problem is that because of the increased sexual desire, they put an increased uh, value upon beauty. And that's just a waste of time. I mean, for crying out loud, how long do you think a woman is going to remain beautiful for? I mean, really, honestly. I mean, I, I say this and I'm going to say it and everyone's going to go, oh, whatever, right? But, you know, you know, you get married, right? And after a little while, she doesn't look like what she looked like when you got married to her, all right? <laughs> okay? Yeah, believe that. And by the way, nor do you, by the way. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Don't just think that she's kind of just lost all the looks because you don't look exactly like Brad Pitt either. Right? And in fact, the, the biggest problem, of course, when the Muslims get married is that, you know, they just become, honestly, become slouches, you know, the way and this and that, whatever, they think it's being religious. This is disaster, you know? How, you know, when I got married, my weight doubled. Doubled. Is that possible? Can you imagine that? I doubled in my weight when I got married, over a period of, I don't know, three years or something like that. I mean, it's just stupid. You just, and practicing Muslims believe that that's okay. You know, because, you know, you're not doing anything, and you're teaching people, and you're doing dawah, and you're doing this and that, whatever you're doing. You're working, you have a family man, and got, the, you know, got, got her in the bag, and what else am I supposed to look forward to? You know what I'm saying? Yeah, this whole mentality, the whole mentality starts to kick in. And it's disgrace, it's an absolute disgrace. She deserves you to be in prime form, and you yeah, deserve her to be in prime form for you. But even that, you know, attraction and maintaining a continual attraction has its own wisdoms and has its own limits. You know, don't, don't think that beauty is the... Let me tell you something. The majority of people who are still married today is not because the other person is beautiful. Do you believe that? If you don't believe that, you better believe that. You think that there's not more beautiful women out there than my wife? You don't think that my wife thinks there's more beautiful men out there than I am? But the reason that we're together is not because of beauty. And that's what people misunderstand. That's why they say love blinds. Because it just takes over the mind. It takes over the heart and your, your senses to start to just lose their priorities. Start to lose the reality. I mean, how stupid can a person be when they think that beauty is going to be some incredibly amazing concept that's going to keep you fixed and hooked for the next 50 years? I mean, what world are you on? I mean, what is wrong with the people who believe like that and think like that? I mean, you know, I mean, does anyone need any further proof? Look at your parents for crying out loud. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you know? I mean, you know. <laughs> I have no offense to his parents. You know? I mean, I'm sure they're good looking in their own way, but the reality is they're not still together. They didn't create, you know, beautiful people like yourselves because they considered beauty to be the absolute priority until today, right? And they didn't give you the stable homes, inshallah, that most of you have had. They haven't given you the love that you have, have gained from them and the good upbringing, inshallah, from them that you have because they consider beauty to be the absolute priority. No. They consider things like respect and parental choice and religion and future and ability to produce and ability to develop. These kind of factors need to take place. So the reason I, I mention this now in the answer to this question is that the most important thing in trying to find a spouse is to first determine what you're looking for and why you're looking for what you're looking for. Try and determine your priorities and understand your priorities, understand what it is that really you hold as important, what should be important to you. And once you understand 
Now that you understand that the person that I want should be religious. Yeah, good looking. Yeah, not ugly. You know, yeah, not whatever. Yeah, you know, should be able to support himself and not be absolutely poor. Yeah, should come from some kind of good family or whatever. I mean, like, but religion, very, very important. You want a person who you know is doesn't take interest in other women, and is maintaining their distance. You see their history is like that. They want to keep. Why is that person? Do you think that person is doing that because he doesn't like girls? There's no single man who doesn't like girls. There's no single man who doesn't like the opposite sex. So if you see a person who's doing that, eyes down, walking around, whatever, and you know that he is fighting a great jihad against himself, don't cut him down for the fact that because he's not all over you, that he's a, he's a nobody. Rather, give him respect for that. And I can tell you something, that you might not look at such a person as, as a, a potential marriage partner at that time, okay? But maybe you you give his you put him down in the midst because of maybe he doesn't look like the greatest person in the world. But you regret it so much afterwards if you went for the better looking, lesser being person. My goodness me, would you regret it? It goes for both sides. So once you're able to then determine what you want as a priority, then you just got to move in them circles. And then in university, it's very easy. Then you're moving in circles of Islamic work and Islamic dawah and the masjid and so on and so on. And you're, once you're in that circle of learning and conferences and talks and whatever, and you recognize that only the people that have some interest in their religion are going to have interest in these things. Or by word of mouth, you know that yeah, so and so started practicing and so and so has been practicing and so and so prays and so and so studies and so and so writes, whatever. Then you know, yeah, that's the kind of person that I'm interested in. And then you start making inquiries. And that is how you find the kind of person, the spouse that you. Uh, are looking for. <clears throat> the scholars who did not get married for the sake of talab al ilm, for seeking knowledge, are they guilty of not following the sunnah, i.e. deliberately turning away from the sunnah? I am talking not about Ghulamah like Ibn Taymiyyah and al Nawawi, who had slave girls, but like Sheikh Yunus al, 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 al Junpuri, who I don't know, from Sahar al uh, uh, who is a muhaddith. Also, Sheikh Abu Ghutta wrote a book on some of these scholars, yet it has been refuted by one of the Sa'udis. Is this allowed or recommended? I don't know of the reputation of Shaykh Abu Ghudda, uh, he was one of my favorite scholars actually. Um, you know, uh, first of all, the, uh, I don't know how easily we can determine and make the difference between certain scholars not getting married and other scholars different times not getting married and so on and so on. Okay, let me tell you something. There are people, right, if you don't, li if you don't move in these circles, then it's difficult. I'm assuming that, I, I don't know who wrote this. If it's a sister, then it'll be very difficult for her to understand. If it's a brother, <coughs> less difficult, but still difficult. If they don't study any, okay? Talab al ilm when you start getting into studying serious knowledge, right? I mean, we're talking serious, you know, uh, uh, just serious knowledge, we're not going to get into details, right? Okay? It's like a drug. <coughs> it's like a drug. I mean, I'm a nobody. Really, I, okay? I'm a very, very small student of knowledge. But I know that if I didn't have responsibilities of children and work and kids and whatever, whatnot, then all I'd want to do is to read books all day, every day, and just someone just come and feed me water and drink and that's it, and, and food and that's it. Really. I wouldn't want to look at anything else, whatever, whatnot. I mean, that's what I think, I suppose. I mean, obviously, I'd probably collapse after a little while, wanting, you know, my desires to be, to be mad food and sexual and this and that, was it? I mean, obviously. But the reality is, is that me at this level, I can see, I've tasted, I've tasted, I'm a nobody as I say. I've, I've tasted the addictiveness of knowledge and the izza of knowledge, the respect that one gains with knowledge internally and externally. Then you now lift that up to that level up there of the ulama, the leaders of this religion, the guides of this religion, who take <coughs> upon themselves the responsibility that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has praised them for specifically in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala raises the people of knowledge by grades, by rank, by status. These people have a massively increased responsibility and an increased reward and honor. And at the same time, not only do they have this great reward and offer, but they really are addicted to studying. And they recognize that to look after a wife and look after children and look after this and whatever will really be a burden and a problem and something that will keep them from actually progressing. Now that is only going to happen to an incredibly small number of people. And that's why when you go through Islamic history, even though the system makes differentiation between Noah and Taymiyyah, you'll find in the classic scholars 10, 20, 50, 100 out of millions. 
And today, the yani sister mentions one or two or three or five or ten, or brother and whoever, mentions a few out of the millions of scholars we've had in the last one or two hundred years. So it's always going to be the very small exception that are going to be able to do that. And remember, marrying a woman, okay, or marriage is not an obligation. Its general ruling is that it's sunnah. But it becomes an obligation if one is not able to control their desires. So the second that you are having to look longer at a woman, or you are having to look at a woman and to look longer at a man, or you start to have thoughts, or you start to have problems, and you start to have difficulty, that is now it. You have now stepped into the haram. That's when the Prophet said in the that Fadiyat is over. Get married. Get married. And if you can't, then you start fasting. Because once that happens, you have to get married now. Now it becomes an obligation. And if you can't, it's an obligation to start fasting, according to the majority of the scholars. An obligation to start fasting. Once you have that problem, you can't control yourself. Your taqwa, your iman can't control it. You can't get married, you have to start fasting. So therefore, yani, the reality, the reasons are clear. They wanted to develop their religion, they wanted to save their religion, they wanted to develop themselves, and they had that drug of, of knowledge took over. But that's an incredibly small minority, which cannot be used for any basis of evidence or used as any example for anyone else. Because the example of the Sunnah is for the example of the majority of people. And the Prophet is Khayr, Khayr Nas, of course, in that. <coughs> and you said it is best to get married ASAP, but don't you think there is a maturity level that needs to be reached first? and some learning about the responsibility of marriage. I do not to be taken lightly. I agree. I fully agree. And our problem, of course, is that we have ages and uh, uh, ages that have been narrated to us from the Sunnah, when, as I said, yeah, the women were very young, but they were women. And men were yeah, very young, but they were men. Right? And that is, of course, different. They had taken on responsibility of serving for the home and bringing up people and had gone and, and, and done business and fought and so on. Whereas the women had been, you know, uh, getting married and, and seen life and tough and so on. And you know, you've seen that if you go back to your own countries, you know, whether it's India, Pakistan or Africa or Africa, you've seen in your villages young girls that you couldn't imagine someone from here who's at 10 years old playing with their teddy bear and not being able to do anything. Whereas over there, a 10 year old is fully looking after the children, going out and working in the houses and cleaning and, and sweeping and looking after all the affairs in the home. And in fact, in the Muslim countries, the younger girls in the practicing household, it's the younger girls that are maintained in the house to run all the house affairs. Why? Because they trust them, they're good at it, and they are too young to be considered to be a fitna for the, the, uh, the owner of the, the house. Okay, so that there's not a mahram problem. So why do you think that they use the enemy? Because they are so mature. That's why. And naturally, we're in a society where immaturity is the norm, not maturity. The men are just a joke, right? I mean, you look at the, look at the times now, we look at ourselves, a joke. The women, you can't call them women, it's just a joke again as well. When you're comparing it, I mean, it's a reality. It's not a picking anyone. I'm, I'm also part of the men, so I come under that thing. And the women, you've got to accept it. Compare yourself to the abilities of your mothers. And then think about comparing yourself to some great, great grandparents and your development and the age that you're in. And it is no comparison. The maturity levels aren't there. It's all about exposure. We've been, we've been brought up in cotton wool in this society. We've been grown up in such a privileged position. It's just incredible. I mean, you heard in the news today, right? That they're worrying about 25, that children are going to be soon having 25 immunizations or vaccines. Okay, 25. And then I got to work today and I opened up the, 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 the drug alert kind of thing and I saw it there in front of my eyes. A new meningitis C vaccine, a new pneumococcal vaccine, a new this vaccine, a new that vaccine. I, you know, it's, 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 does your mind it? This is covered, the theory is covered, XY is covered, XY. And you know what was really interesting is I went on to read this, the statement of Liam Donaldson, who's the, the chief medical officer or whatever. And he and he, he found a really pertinent point. He said, we're introducing this, and despite the concerns and the worries of certain groups of people, we are introducing this to ensure that our children have the best possible start in life. And that's really praiseworthy and it's good. But that super protection has caused this kind of, this child, the yani mentality that sticks with us until 15, 20, 25 years old. You don't, you couldn't trust a person at 20 years old to go and run the house and business and so on. Is that the reality or not? And so when you recognize that there is immaturity, then yes, maybe you do need to, you do, you do need to, you know, slow down and say, well, you know, I'm not mature enough or the other person's potentially not mature enough. And so therefore then you have to then take other measures. You have to then start to control your desires more or you have to start fasting more. That's just the reality. Maturity is important. It is important. But that does not mean that we should just write off getting married young. 
And that does not mean that those who get married young are, uh, the, the, the marriage is, is necessarily written off. Because that's not the case either. Because many times, young people who are immature get married and they become mature very, very quickly. And there's a khayr in that. And Sharia does not somehow write that off as a possibility. It does not write, not write that off as a possibility. And in fact, marriage and the marital relationship and the marital responsibilities make a person more mature and it brings maturity to a person quicker than any other process. Quicker than any other process. So you shouldn't just write off the fact that, yeah, people are immature, they laugh a lot, joke a lot, and so on and so on. They, you know, shouldn't get married because it's immature. No. Find a person who's good, that you see the good in them, man and woman, and then get married to them. Because that marriage in itself is what completes half the deed. And that completing half the deen is like completing half the maturity. Because only an immature person has half a religion. Because religion is all about maturity. That's why the Prophet ﷺ said, at the end, at half of your iman is completed, half your religion is completed. That's the whole link to that. Maturity in itself is found in taking the responsibility as a husband, as a breadwinner, as a father, as the one who has to now deal with new rulings to protect his wife and her rights and her issues and, and so on and so on. Uh, okay. Uh, I'm going to take these remaining questions uh, very, very quickly. Uh, about the friends topic, when you said you can't have friends like is the opposite sex, how do you want to interact with each other, especially in the university, without being friends or friendly? I mean, uh, obviously, I mean, with the opposite sex, I really don't believe that no one, you need to have a friend from the opposite sex. Giving salam, alaykum salam, that's, that's fine. But really, is there a need for us to be friendly? You know, loose with the, uh, with, with the other people. I don't know even being getting being loose is being blasé with the rest of the people. I just mean, is there any real need to develop any sort of relationship with the opposite sex other than what is necessary? There isn't. I mean, if there is, then tell me if I'm wrong. Really, I mean, write again and, you know, say, you know, I challenge you at the top. You know, so then I pick it up. <laughs> yeah? Because I, I just can't see, I can't see it. I mean, you know, I could be wrong. I really could be. But I mean, you know, we have a, we maintain a civil relationship. You don't abuse the other person. You just, yeah, you know, you ask how you are or whatever. Then that's fine. And in the scheme of things, but like, as I said, your heart knows. You do know. You're a very good judge of your own character and a very good judge of your own behavior because you know what you can't do. You know when things are getting dangerous because, yeah, as I said, you know, don't don't redo that whole thing again. Yeah, when it happens to the body and all that kind of thing. Because I've just done it once and did a best of myself, right? You know when you start to get that feeling that you're going into the forbidden area, right? You know that things are getting just a bit too, 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 too pushy, yeah? What if you marry, what if you marry with two people, what if you marry with two people not really in deen? Then one of you comes into his hadeen, but the other is not as willing, what do you do? Uh, I mean, I, I'm assuming that two people get married and one starts practicing and the other one doesn't, right? Or uh, has it. You know this, this, this point is a real major problem of our time. The real major problem of our time. And you know what the main cause? The main cause is usually the husband who starts to go and starts to practice by going out and studying and going circles and leaves the girl at home to cook the roti and look after the mom and blah 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 and deal with the house and you know whatever. And forgets that, hold on, you know, this is I'm meant to go and study and, 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 and uh, you know, learn and, you know, go to Iman building talks and, you know, whatever. So does she. So does she. And that's what's going to happen. If you leave her to just, you know, rock by the wayside at home and you're out there getting all these Iman booths and you're listening to these lectures and khutbahs and writing all this studying, learning about this and that, and doing hifs and doing hadith and whatever. And she just at home and doing nothing, right? Trying to uh, do the whole thing by herself, reading books and, you know, listening to something on the internet or something. I mean, come on. So, uh, always, it happens a lot. Unfortunately, I mean, I, I can think of just straight away three divorces in the last whatever. Due to a person who's really practicing, the man and the woman, Yanni Miskin, she's not practicing. I mean, yeah, you, you can't blame the religion and the husband totally for a woman not practicing. But you can see how it happened if they started off at the same time. They started off both not practicing at the same time. And obviously, that is an added, uh, added reason for you to be careful when you get married to your partner that you know. Uh, how can you know someone is truly practicing if you're restricted in terms of getting to know them? Very good question. Very good question, and that's why you need to have a very good, a very solid approach to the to the meetings that you have. And you can have as many as you wish, as long as it's done in the correct and with the parents there or other people there. Ask the questions that matter. Yeah, and you don't need to ask everything and know everything. And as I said, you don't need to prioritize certain things that you thought was a priority before, because these things develop in marriage. 
As I said, if you think that you're going to go and try and, and marry someone who's your best friend, because you know they're every in and out, the reality is, is that who said that marriages work when the other person knows every other person, every single ins and outs over the last two, three years of a relationship? Who said that, that, that that's the case? Time is greater than those who had with extended kind of contact before marriage. There's no proof of their statement that you know you need to get someone, know someone so, so incredibly well. No, you don't need to. I challenge that. The Sharia yani, allows you to make up, uh, get enough information for you to make up your mind to make that decision. And then to Allah, put your trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's the whole point of this. This is an action of ibadah. Yani, make sure you get the priorities first. Make sure you try and find the priorities. And you look at the person and you seek advice, you seek people. Seek. Obviously, you just can't rely upon your own uh, uh, you know, ability to, to, to see something. Take advice, speak to their friends. Yeah, speak to get other people to give you opinions upon you know these people or the families and get other people involved and you know as you normally would do for any important decision everyone knows that when you want to make an important decision you will research you will find out certain opinions you do you, you go to uh, you know whatever this my this is maybe slightly random but why is it that a girl may not go to university away from home i.e like away from home yeah, I mean, the specific uh, 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 upon a woman traveling, okay, comes under the general precept, the general precept in Sharia to try and protect the honor of the woman, okay, and, yani, because the woman, especially in a society like today, and even back in the day, yani, a woman by herself is seen as vulnerable, and I don't think it needs to be uh, uh, proved to anyone, and the Sharia requires that, the, yani, Islam takes the Izza of the woman, whether yani, uh, our own women, married, whatever, or just any Muslim woman, Muslima from the Ummah, incredibly seriously. For us, every single Muslima on the street, yani, whatever her level of practicing or whatever, whatnot, is like she, she should be regarded like our sister, like our real sister. Okay? So anything that th threatens her, her safety or puts anything or puts her at any form of risk, and remember, she is at risk. Not sometimes an obvious risk, you know, of this being attacked, but she's at risk due to her certain uh, inclinations, her certain yani, weakness in emotion, her desires for, uh, or her easiness, for example, to be persuaded in certain ideas, her easiness, for example, or her, or her increased gullibility in falling for someone. And that's a fact. This is not things that I can just, you know, and this is not the joking part, this is the serious part, right? That women themselves, okay, when they fall in love, it happens often easier than the man and deeper than the man. And that means she's at risk. And she's out there yani, in a situation where people can take advantage of her. And if the men, if the women are now thinking, you know, how patronizing and how whatever, then now, yeah, I'm sorry. But that's just the reality. If you can't accept that, then fine. Sharia says that. Sharia believes that the woman needs to be protected. And that's why, yani, it requires a mahram to be available as, as much as close as possible, someone to look after her needs and so on and so on. We just try to to to, uh, to protect the situation. I only have a few minutes left. Um, and what's the ruling of what's the Islamic ruling of jokes? And is it allowed to shave the beards in Islam? Islamic ruling of jokes and joking is allowed as long as you don't go and do the filthy and haram and all that kind of thing. And as for the uh, shaving beards in Islam, of course haram. The shaving uh, the shaving of a beard is haram, okay, for the man, right? Uh, for the woman, it's good, but you've got to shave your beard. <laughs> 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 uh, but uh, the, uh, the uh, thingy, ah. Shave, shaving. So what? We like to get uh, shaving, shaving is what is haram. As for trimming and so on, and keeping a short beard, then inshallah that's something permissible. Inshallah, according to and certainly the opinion that I follow, and to, to allow a beard to grow fully, right? To at least, or, or maybe even perfectly, a fist length, then that is yani, uh, the sunnah of the Prophet. And to keep it tidy and trim is something permissible, and there's no problem with that, inshallah. Um, is it possible for a young woman studying to get married and balance her education career? Yeah, I, I, I do believe so. It is. I have to say that, yani, that it, it, it is difficult, but it is possible. And there are certain women, for example, in certain careers like, you know, I don't know, like law or medicine, where they believe that they have an extra obligation because there's less women in there, you know, that, that, that field. And yeah, fair enough, it's possible an argument.
You know, not always the case, but maybe if a woman, if one particular girl is very talented and she believes and recognizes her own talent and recognizes that she could become and really do some benefit, then yeah, fair enough, then she should maybe then marry someone who has that lesser kind of, uh, you know, requirements. Because really, you know, I have no doubt, and in my personal opinion, as I said, it's very difficult. I believe strongly that the relationship and that the family will suffer. They really will. Alongside the, the need for, our, for educated women and you know, professions to be developed for the women and so on, I really know and believe. I look at my wife, I look at my wife and I think to myself, uh, you know, there would be no marriage if she was working. It just wouldn't be possible. I, it wouldn't be possible for me to continue and do what I do. Would it be possible for my children? Would it be possible for my home? And she recognizes it wasn't possible, and she has absolutely no desire. And actually, when I'm sitting, when I'm discussing Yani and uh, Islam, when I'm lecturing to non-Muslims, okay, the non-Muslim women, it's the, it's the greatest thing that, that they find about Islam. Like, they can just sit at home and don't have to work. They love it. Especially working women, they think yeah, they're working and yeah, to get some kind of support and then they recognize that we tell them that then they always ask you, so are you married and you know, how many kids you got and whatever, whatnot and they hear that your wife has never ever worked ever, ever, not lifted up, you know, whatever I mean, I'm outside of home, like she doesn't work at home anyway but, okay. <laughs> the, 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 you know, the reality is, is that outside, they see that as well, subhanAllah yeah, well, they don't say subhanAllah, we say subhanAllah, they come back really, right? and so, uh, you know, don't don't take this lightly about trying to balance careers and professions and thinking that it's going to work in a, in a marriage. I feel I'm very close to bringing an Muslim woman to Islam with the help of Allah. What are the boundaries? Is it permitted for me to speak to her as a Muslim man? It is permitted. Same boundaries apply. Same boundaries apply as soon as you know that you've gone above the, 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 the necessary uh, uh, the, the limits. You've got to put away, you've got to stop. And the reality is that the limits come up very quick and very sudden. So the best and safest thing to do is to transfer it over to you know, some of your sisters uh, here. And you have really active you know, sisters in this society. First time in my entire life, by the way, that I've been had uh, something arranged by a sister. Uh, okay, this is your university, by the way. Take that as a praise or take that as a don. You know, uh, take that as a, uh, a criticism, however you wish to take it. But you, know, you have plenty of people here who can deal with uh, uh, non-Muslims and uh, women situations. Your women are much, much more active than your men. And look at the, look at the numbers, I mean, subhanAllah. And, and actually, from my own experience, and when we have study circles, and we have, uh, for example, we do, uh, I, I teach in, uh, in Manchester, and the women regularly double uh, outnumber the, the men two to one. The women are always writing notes. The women don't go anywhere without a notebook. The women are always memorizing. The women are always writing everything that they hear. Because women have much more greater inaya for, 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 the, for the lesson. And in reality, it's because they need it more, because they have less of an opportunity to have exposure to that. But at least they take the opportunity. So men, yani today, these days, in the modern kind of dawah thing with women like that doing everything, and who needs any men to do that kind of stuff? Now, as a woman, how do you get married when you don't have any proposals, and you don't know anyone to get married to, and your parents aren't that interested either? And you have to go through a spree. That's pretty depressing, you know what I mean? <laughs> 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 I don't think that's the case. I don't think that's the case of any Muslim woman. Really, I don't. SubhanAllah. And if you're this woman, come speak to me. <laughs> come speak to me. And, okay, I mean that. If you really think that you're in this situation, come speak to me. I'll find you a husband. Don't worry. <laughs> Man and woman can't be alone on one to one basis, as, and third is straight line. How about internet and chatting? People do meet in this way, and these to some marriage. What is your view? Is it haram? The, my view is that it is one of those interactions that is, has its necessity, limits, uh, like every other interaction, whether speaking or whether on the phone or whether the internet, change the mode, it's all the same. You maintain a certain limit and then you will know once you've gone too far. You know, uh, you know some of you have seen the, the, the um, uh, I don't promote, uh, uh, I, you know, I don't promote too much use of the website. Uh, what I, have, I have my own and there's many people who have their own and I'm not into promoting sites so I won't even tell you about that but there is one site that I've seen that has a very funny cartoon of a, of a mock MSN conversation between you know men and the women practicing of course and I like it because it's so true because that's what happens in universities 
that the men and women who are practicing think that somehow they're you know God's gift to, to Islam and the Islam society, and they're not going to come under no kind of fitna or any kind of problem, right? And so they, you know, the, the, the conversation always in these cartoons always start off with the sister, sister Nadia and brother Abdul kind of thing, right? And it's just, alaykum, alaykum salam, and you know, did you do this work? And, and within two, three lines, it's gone right over to, hey, you look really nice. And, you know, and it's very, very funny. And uh, you'll, you'll find that on the internet. You find in all of these forums. I'm sure that yeah, your own website will have some links to it uh, as well. Uh, and if you just see the cartoons, it just illustrates how how easily it happens. I mean, that's done in a very funny way, but in a realistic way, it's true. You know, MSN and that kind, these kind of things, and these chat systems, and whatever, whatnot. It's just like every other mode of communication. Really, it's just you've got to control yourself. So, what advice would you give to young Muslims who are not in a position to marry but want to, uh, but want to? Passing the solution, yes but its effects may not last. Well, that's a good question as well, to be honest. Yani, a person has to have more uh, control of oneself because fasting is meant to be the absolute end. Because a man to be fasting continuously is something you know, difficult, realistically. I mean, it's something which is uh, uh, you know, difficult, especially in our country. I mean, everyone's been enjoying short days and whatever, fasting and relaxing and, you know, Early, early finishes, late starts, whatever. Imagine having to fast continuously throughout the summer where we don't even know where Fajr is starting, we don't even know where Maghrib is ending, we don't even know what's happening. You know, the day starts at God knows what time, and 9, 10 o'clock, and the sun still hasn't set, and we're still really worrying what's going to happen when fasting comes around again uh, at that time. And it is a difficult thing, and you, one has to try and believe that the fast on a continual basis is the last kind of operation. You really have to try and, you know, uh, uh, as I said, appreciate the danger. One who appreciates the danger and appreciates the wisdom of Sharia and dealing with that danger will find it easier. But then you have to ask Allah Subhanahu wa for help. And the Prophet ﷺ, in a beautiful hadith, the Prophet Sallallahu has said in a, in a context narration that Allah Subhanahu wa helps three people. Specifically, he helps three people. One of them is a person who wants to get married, uh, who wants to get married in order to protect oneself. Allah Subhanahu wa helps that person. So you've got to make yourself sincere and, uh, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and use the wasail, the means and modes to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in, in order to achieve that aim. And you will be helped from places that you have not You have not even considered, you've never thought of, the help will come from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Maybe you'll be put in a position to get married. And then end the story. Maybe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make things easy for you. And then you'll get uh, uh, some, some, some help. And to finish off, uh, is this is the main question. Right. Okay. Uh, introduced marriages, talking over the phone for several months before marriage. Is this sinful? Um, introduced marriages, talking over the phone for several months before marriage. Is this sinful? I'm assuming that nikah has not occurred. The Islamic yani, contract has not been uh, completed, and it's just a continual conversation. For haram, you know, you know, to say something haram is haram is difficult. By the way. Right? It's, it's not something which is, oh, I just say it's haram, then that's it's haram. So I, I don't want to know, I don't want to say it's haram, or I can't say it's haram, or whatever. What I can say, though, is that, uh, and this is a very important point, actually, I should have made it before in the talk, uh, earlier on in the, in the first part, right? That, you know, in this situation, this constant contact with the idea that you're going to get married, but you don't have any guarantee of that marriage, and before marriage. The reason why that's a problem is because, yeah, I commonly, something happens and the situation splits up or something happens from externally that causes the whole thing to end. And that's fine, because you have that nikah, right? In a normal classic situation, if you had like the basic level of interaction, the two parties were happy, and then you step back and just look forward to the day of Walima and getting together and enjoying your, you know, your first night and so on and so on. That model, compared to this one, where, right, you've met up, you're happy now, potentially you're going to get married, well, one year, one, one group of parents are saying, yeah, yeah, whatever, another group is saying, no, no, we're going to have to finish the degree, another one saying, blah, blah, and then suddenly so it gets pushed down from a year and a half, a year and a half or two, and you guys are constantly in conversation, you're saying, no, we're not going to meet up because that's haram, but we're going to at least keep in contact, email, and so on, so on, so on. You know when you keep this contact, right? Well, you shouldn't, you shouldn't be. This is what I'm advising, you shouldn't be. Well, obviously, what happens? The desire grows, the love grows, the attraction grows, the friendship grows, right? Now you're not married, right? Technically you're nothing. You're two prospective you know, people who are going to get married. 
and someone comes and the parents decide X and sometimes Y, and you can think of your own reason, put your own reason in this gap, okay? I can tell you that in the last couple of years, I don't know, three, four, five cases I can specifically remember of people that were in this exact situation, the parents then decided not to let the marriage go ahead, they were not aware of how much contact had developed in between, and then they were then forced to get married to other people, forced in a gentle sense, right, with good reasons or whatever, whatever. And both of the people are now unhappy in their marriage and in secret contact with each other in their new marriages. Is that what Islam wants? It doesn't, of course it doesn't. So when you hear, firstly, that can we can talk, it sounds innocent, of course it does. You know, it's not major, you're shia and chatting over the phone, you're going to get married soon. When you look at it from that side, but look at it from this side. And now you realize that actually, no, it's not as so rosy as that. There's a reason why Sharia tries to minimize these interactions, because Sharia recognizes the strength of emotion, the strength of love and lust and desire. It recognizes it. And he's and very, very careful about it. That's why it says, listen, just chill on that idea, chill on that concept. And that's why we try and keep these things separate, so that love doesn't develop, so that you, you are able then, as soon as you're able to come in, you're able to walk away as well without ramifications. So if you don't, not only you ruin your own and fall into the haram, you ruin one miskin woman who's just got married, you married the, you ruin other miskin marriage, you ruin other parents' ideas, and, and it's destruction. That's why I said before, yeah, and, uh, being selfish and not being able to control oneself is a destruction to yourself and a destruction to the rest of society as well. That's why people have to uh, understand their responsibilities. Um, uh, please, could you explain this with regards to the caste system many parents hold? Yani, you know, uh, the reality is is that parents have the right to recommend uh, uh, people to get married uh, and so on, and who to get married to, etc. Uh, but the reality is is that they can't force you. They can't force you into that situation, and. Not, and I want to say that all, not all the time is their recommendation a bad one. I'll say that. Don't give the parents some credit. Yeah, I, mean, I know that a lot of the time they you know, really mess things up, right? But a lot of the time they're looking out for some benefits that you're not seeing due to your immaturity or due to your inexperience, whatever, that they've seen. Okay? But for a person to be religiously, uh, racially kind of you know, flippant about he's of that caste and he's of that's haram, of course. You can't get married to him because he's a Gujarati, you can't get married to him because he's Pakistani, or you can't get married to him because he's a Bengali or whatever. That's just, just Bakwas, isn't it, really? I mean, you know. And of course, no space for that in the, in the Sharia. There's a few other questions, which unfortunately I don't think there's a, any time left. And I'm tired, but it's my fault, it's hurting. I'm about to And like I said, I ask you to forgive me for the fractured nature of the talk because I wasn't looking forward to coming. I really didn't want to do it. And, uh, but anyway, it was really nice to see you all. Barak Allah Feek, I've taken out two hours of your time, or two and a half hours of your time. So, Barak Allah Feek, for that, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala yani, help us in our battle. And really, it's a battle yani, to maintain our chastity and to maintain our izzah and our purity in these difficult times. We ask Allah نسأل الله أن تقبل من صالح الأعمال ونتوفق لنا إلا ما يحب الله وصلى الله صلى الله عليه وسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم معين بارك الله فيك السلام عليكم ورحمة الله